Yeah. And hello, everyone, and welcome to the next fireside chat. My name is Sharon, and I work for the Zero Project on this wonderful conference. Um, and we're going to be speaking today about supporting a young person with high needs to access independent living, political participation, and community inclusion. And for that, we have these lovely ladies with us. We have Donna and Laura. Donna, can you please introduce yourself? Of course. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm really very happy to be here today. My name is Donna Thompson, and I'm the mother of a young man, uh, Nicholas Wright, who is 34 years old. Nicholas uh, lived with us for 23 years in what I will describe as a home ICU setting. He's very technologically dependent, and he's dependent on 24-hour awake care uh, to support his life and his needs and his choices. So in 2011, um, Nicholas moved into a nearby care home, the Ottawa Rotary Home, and um, in the meantime, I am an author of two books, and I am an educator at McMaster University in the areas of family caregiving and family engagement in disability health research. So that's who I am. And Laura? Hi, um, I'm Laura de Becklesell, and I am the acting director of client services at the Ottawa Rotary Home. I am also a registered nurse. Um, so I've been working with Donna and Nicholas and their family for approximately five um, and a half years now. So the Ottawa Rotary Home, we're in um, very snowy Ottawa, and we uh, provide respite and residential care for young adults and children with um, medical complexities and those with neuromuscular musculoskeletal disabilities um, as well. And I'm also the mom of three uh, little little kiddos. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. Thank you. And it's, it's such a great um, way to just see a holistic approach to a case study, right? So we really, we're going to hear about this holistic approach. So let's start off. Um, Donna, can you please describe Nicholas and his circle of care? Um, the communication between Nicholas, the family, and of course, Laura, jump in, um, and the staff. Sure, of course. Well, Nicholas has quite a, a large circle of care. Um, as you can imagine, it takes an army to support him and all of his, 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 his wonderful life. Uh, I will begin by saying that when I received an invitation to speak at the Zero Conference Project conference this year, uh, I looked at the themes of independent living and um, political participation and ICT, and I, I thought, gosh, how are people with very significant impairments going to be included in this really important international conversation? And I thought about Nick, I thought about our family, I thought about the Ottawa Rotary Home, and I thought, you know what, we are doing this. We are really doing this. For, for Nicholas Wright. And, um, and it's not that complicated, but it does take a great deal of intention. So Nicholas, uh, as I mentioned, is very medically complex. He has um, chronic pain. He needs a lot of bed rest. He, um, he has a great deal of cognitive uh, capacity but he is non-speaking mostly. He uses uh, a low-tech communication system. When he was in school, he used a Dynavox a speaking computer device with head switches mounted on his wheelchair, but because he needs so much bed rest now, uh, we've transferred that uh, high-tech system to a low-tech communication book that requires partner-assisted scanning of reading all his word choices from that book, um, and that's uh, the responsibility of his his bedside caregivers. Um, he has had 99 hospitalizations in his life. He has voted in every municipal and federal and provincial election over since he's been um, of age to do that. He does a lot of research online. His room is technically so set up for TV, internet, um, all audible books, all kinds of things like that. And this is an individual who has a mild intellectual uh, delay. 
and um, you know, as I say, a lot of physical need for support. So, uh, including medical um, emergency interventions, 99 hospitalizations. He's, um, you know, he's very medically uh, complex. So, Laura, maybe you can talk about a little bit about the circle of care and how it works between Nick, Rotary Home staff, and our family. Yeah, absolutely. So as Donna mentioned, this is a, a fairly medically complex individual. He does require 24-7 care. Um, so he has one-on-one. -on -one. He has a staff member with him basically throughout his entire life, you know, with very few small, you know, exceptions, a, a bathroom break, a coffee break, um, for example. And those um, caregivers are nurses during the evening. Um, he is complex enough that he does require someone to support him overnight and those nurses need to be able to intervene at a moment's notice and know exactly what to do whether it's to wake him up to stimulate breathing um, to administer medication to stop a seizure for example so in the midst of this very medical environment um, this band is leading an incredible life and one thing that always you know our model here is it's one team um so all of our caregivers they come together they work together and this is one life that nick is leading so for example you might have a nurse um at night and they're working on a project together that project continues into the next day, into the next day. It doesn't matter if it's a new staff member with them. It really doesn't matter. They plan Nicholas, Nicholas's life, not the life of the staff. And that's abundantly clear too. Our staff go into his home. This is his room by extension, the entire Ottawa Rotary home, our kitchen area, our living room area. Our staff enter into his home. Nick is not in their workplace. This is his home. And I, I think just that mentality going in um, makes this a really fun and enjoyable um, place. And Nick is just such a wonderful person to support. He has so many varied interests. Um, you know, our staff walk away at the end of every day saying, my goodness, I've learned something. You know, certainly anytime I go in and I, I chat to Nick about something, I learn something new, whether it's, you know, his varied technology, um, but also just at how he engages in life and, you know, how somebody who seems on paper, and he, he certainly is very medically complex, how is he able to do all of this? How can he write a blog? Uh, a blog? Um, for example, Nick has um, done um, letters to the editor that have been published in newspapers. I can't get something published. And then we have Nick, who's, you know, with everything against him, you know, he's not able to write. He's not able to talk it out. He's able to write something that the content is so well done that it's published. It's well researched. Um, you know, he's certainly my go-to person if I need any sort of hockey information, you know, who should I bet on? Um, he He's great. Um, but that is very much facilitated by our staff that mentality that we're here for for Nicholas we're here for him to lead his best life um, so they've done some really amazing things together um, a big uh, thing for us a couple of months ago is Nick with supported by two of his staff went to Toronto and when you think about you know Toronto it's about six hours when you're looking at traffic it's Canada it is cold outside. It's the middle of COVID. There's lots of masking rules. So a lot of preparation went into that. Um, a lot of, you know, discussion with staff, with Nicholas, with Donna um, as well, with the family. It's very much everybody works to make this happen and it happened very successfully. That is incredible. Um, so just following what you were saying, can you maybe describe how Nicholas communicates his choices uh, regarding his self-directed lifestyle as well as civic and political participation? How does it all happen? I can begin by speaking about Nicholas's um, communication. As a matter of fact, we had an in-service <laughs> last week with uh, the Rehabilitation Center speech-language pathologist here in Ottawa. And, you know, People, Nicholas's staff on their own time 
came to that in-service, and there were 17 of them on the call, which is a testament to their commitment to Nicholas's right to communicate. So um, everyone is supporting that right to communicate Nicholas's, you know, Nick to communicate his choices, his preferences, his beliefs, and his feelings. So, um, uh, you know, he does that, as I mentioned, with a low-tech communication book, which the staff use um, to scan word choices. But the other thing is that um, he has some limited speech, which he uses very, very creatively. And of course, like anyone with a disability or a second language, the more you know him um, and the context of his communication within the context of his life, you can understand him a lot, actually, with the very limited speech he has. So usually people go to the communication system if they can't figure out what he's trying to say verbally. However, I will say that with respect to political participation, um, you know, this, I think that part of our discussion today really begins with the values that we hold as a family about civic uh, participation and Nicholas's right and um, his need to be supported to engage politically. So we really believe this is very important in our family. So um, my husband and I talk to Laura, others, frontline staff at the Rotary Home, and especially to Nicholas about the political landscape, uh, as we do with our daughter, too. We talk about the rise of populism and disinformation. We help him determine what is true and what is not true. And I will say that for a while, um, during the Trump presidency, Nicholas was being led down that path of disinformation and thinking that populism on TV was entertainment. And we, we, we had to have lots of talks with him and do a lot of online research with him. Um, and uh, I would say not never to tell him what to think or what to do, particularly with his vote, which is cast in secret anyway. But um, I think, importantly, he has developed a skill as an adult now to understand politically what is in his own best interest, how to vote in his own best interest and research that. So um, we have, uh, we're very lucky in Canada that people will come to his home um, to take his vote. And they have that service. Um, Laura, were you at Rotary when the voting teams have come in? Yep, absolutely. Um, so they're fantastic. They they come in a team of two. I, I would guess that's probably just to ensure that um, you know the vote is actually taken you know correctly, and they come at a time that is convenient to to us and to Nicholas. And they're they're lovely, and they go right um, right into the home, and Nick is able to cast that vote again um, privately away from any you know any staff members. So it works very very quickly and very uh, very flawlessly. Mm -hmm. That's right. So again, I think it begins with values, like everything begins with shared values uh, across. Uh, the team and we um, are we really want Nicholas to always be politically involved and as Laura mentioned um, he has very strong opinions about everything and uh, he has written letters to the editor of the Ottawa Citizen newspaper um, often his letters have to do with the role of sports in um, in his life and in the life of our city um, so he has written letters to the editor and uh, he's had some published and some also rejected, which is uh, part of the civic engagement as well. You're not always successful at getting your voice out there. That's great. Thank you. Um, maybe you can share some of the best practices that you've all holistically developed um, that, you know, and give some real life examples. Those are the best. I mean, you've given some, but give more because those are the best. We learn the most from them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, 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 I think the example of best practice that I'd like to talk a little bit about 
is um, our person-centered planning process, Laura. Uh, this, is a, this is a process, and at first I have to say my husband and I were a bit skeptical about it because there is so much lips, empty lip service paid often to, oh, what are your dreams, what are your gifts, all of these vernacular that people go on about in developmental services, and we thought, oh, this is a waste of time, you know, at first, except that it isn't. At, in the case of Nicholas Wright, <laughs> because we truly do um, plan his life with Nicholas and say, what are your six month goals? What are your long term goals? Working backwards, how are we going to achieve those goals and who is going to do what? And we, uh, in this way, um, Nicholas's life is a project that requires project management and a collaborative team approach where we all share common values. And Laura, maybe you can describe what it's like when we all sit down together with Nicholas and what kind of that meeting looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to add too, you know, not only are we, we creating goals for Nicholas, but we're also accountable to the ministry as well. Um, they hold us accountable that we make efforts to achieve that but beyond that it's really our, our staff coming back and saying laura this toronto trip it has to happen like it, you know they don't ministry that that's for me to deal with but it's that um that respect for for nicholas that we all have and those friendships that we've developed that we're all working together to have this happen. Um, so basically we sit down several times a year, but generally, you know, one big annual review and we ask everybody in his care team. Um, so anyone who works with him frequently and then our, our management staff overseeing as well, family members, and most importantly, Nicholas himself you know, what are things that we appreciate about him? And it's time to, to really come about and say, you know, I, I love the fact that he's so inventive in the kitchen. And then that'll translate itself into a goal. Well, maybe Nick, you could do a charcuterie board um, for our staff one day. And, you know, he might hate the idea or he might absolutely love the idea. So that's for all of us to sit down and what needs to happen to make this happen. So for the Toronto trip, that was a dream of his for probably Probably, I'd say, you want to say years, eh, Donna? Yeah, um, a few years. Quite, yeah, quite a while, and particularly to see the Hockey Hall of Fame, big surprise there, um, but a number of other attractions in, in Toronto as well. And I mean, we were at the height of COVID. How do we do this safely? It took a lot of conversations and a lot of research on Nicholas's part too. When you speak of, you know, accessibility and he's going to have to stay a couple nights in a hotel, it's not enough to just say, hey, bingo, they have accessible rooms. Uh, you know, Nick had to call and find out, well, when you say accessible, can my lift fit under the bed? You know, is there a place for this and this? Is there a fridge for my, um, my G-tube feeds, for example, my medications? A lot of planning went on that, um, but I, I can't, will say it's, I love being parts, uh, a part of those meetings. It's just the collaboration is amazing. And together things things happen we're so much better when you've got a community of 20 people supporting an individual and everybody has you know different connections and different experiences and they can bring that to the table uh, so it's it's really neat and we look at those goals on a monthly basis to see what are we doing to achieve those goals and are those goals even still applicable um, as well sometimes you know as with anybody interests change and we have to adapt to it Yep. Um, so we have a few more minutes, about five more minutes. So I wanted to ask you kind of wrapping up, you know, your big message you know, to the audience, to the people hearing us, the, the professionals here at the conference, the professionals online, family members. Um, what would be kind of like your, your message to the world? <laughs> well, I think from my perspective, um, I've <laughs> said it a number of times, but I think uh, it's, I think you need, first of all, to, to be very explicit, state explicitly your values and what matters to each member of the team. What matters most to you? The first person we always ask is, of course, Nicholas. 
Um, and we always want to know what matters to him so that we can so that he can live his best life. So so for example, when Laura said, you know, he he really, even though he doesn't eat much because he is mostly G2 fed, he does have a great big interest in food. So the Rotary Home doesn't stop at facilitating his cooking or interest in food. They gave him a grocery card so that a credit card to buy groceries so that he can go out and buy what he wants. This is what I'm talking about, about following through on the goals and intentions of, um, of, of someone who states what matters to them most. It also matters what his family thinks. And, you know, as I said, Nicholas wants to vote um, and he wants to be involved civically in uh, both locally, provincially, nationally. He really cares about politics um, and he's very interested. So we help out on that. And I guess, Laura, I would love if you talk about the way that we maintain communication on a regular basis, because that's the other key thing, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, everything falls apart if you don't have people who communicate, right? Yeah. And uh, it, it's definitely that one team approach, right? Very careful handover. And, you know, I'll so often hear a staff being, so today you're you're going to the park and you're packing this lunch and you're this and this, and this is what we've done to prep that for you. And, you know, the staff walk in and say, oh, amazing, fantastic. They weren't part of that planning project um, process. They were maybe off um, for a couple of days, but it's one life. They're expected to jump right in and, and carry on with that. And that is with a lot of written communication, verbal communication, and a lot of Nick knowing what's going on as well. Um, he's really the key. He's a holder of all this information. And then um, also I need to know from a, an agency perspective, um, you know, make sure I know where everybody is. If they've taken the van and driven to a different city, I'd like to know about it. Um, and parents want to know too. Um, Donna and, and Jem are amazingly involved um, too and, and can help encourage and you know can sometimes step in um, it, as well and discuss things with us so a lot of um, verbal phone calls emails going back and forth um, at the end of um, everyday staff are expected to write just a synopsis on what um, Nick did that day so it's a good prompt for everybody to say oh okay you know that that's really neat and you know let's talk to him further about that so we use a variety of communication tools obviously medically we have our own um, tools that we use for documentation as well to make sure that he's set to go um, from a medical perspective so it sounds like the key really is communication on all fronts between all parts of this triangle um, ladies I think you know you took person sent this person-centered approach to a whole new level it's incredible um, and kudos to you both, um, you know, part Donna, part of the family, and, uh, and Laura, and the part of the service provider. It's really an in incredible, incredible case study. Thank you, ladies, so much for being with us today and for sharing your story. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone out there watching. Um, and the next fireside chat will start again soon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Best wishes for a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye.